the mindset is so important to get straight first that we're not running around begging and chasing and selling and asking people for money. What are we doing? We are showing them a way that they can make really, really high rates of return safely and securely. That's, you know, not putting their money in the bank, but investing uh, in our program, all backed by real estate. And it's a win-win scenario. They all absolutely love it. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Conner. You know, I don't recommend to anybody starting out in real estate investing the way I did. I just relied on my experience from the manufactured housing business. I didn't go to any seminars. I didn't go to any conferences. That was a huge mistake because I tell you, there's no telling how many hundreds of thousands of dollars that I have lost because I didn't have the education that I needed for this industry. Welcome to the Cash Flow Fight Club podcast in the Champions Corner edition. I'm Mike Deaton, and together with Lydia, my co host in life, business, and this podcast, we're taking you into the training room, deep in the dojo, sharing the secrets of what it takes to forge a champion. We're digging deep into mindset mastery, high performance habits, best in class behaviors, and bringing you the tips and techniques that maximize human potential, brought to you from some of the best in the business. So grab your buds and your seat. Hit subscribe and get ready to up your game. Let's do the show. Let's do it. Welcome to this In the Champions Corner episode of the Cashflow Fight Club podcast. We have a super fun champion joining us today, Jay Connor. Jay has built an incredible real estate business in his local market. Jay started his house flipping business in 2003. And after years of growth, he hit a snag in 2009 when banks stopped lending to real estate businesses as a result of the Great Recession of 08. Jay began networking with other business people and discovered the power of raising private capital to fund his real estate ventures and keep his business going. He has never looked back and now gives dozens of investors the opportunity to grow their own wealth through great real estate deals. Jay's also the host of his own podcast, Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. Jay is so friendly, approachable, and has an entertaining story to tell about just about everything. So let's jump right in with Jay Connor, the private money authority. Okay, Jay Connor, fresh off your victory in a matchup. Uh, welcome back to the Cashflow Fight Club podcast. Thank you so much for having me back. Um, my lands, that was fun on the uh on the three rounds in the rink there uh with the ladies. That was that was pretty exciting. <laughs> <laughs> we have fun with those and, yes. and you were you were a great uh participant in that. So yeah, we we really loved it and we're we're excited to to get into it once again. Um and so yeah, on this one, I, what I'm thinking is just uh let's let's kind of start back at at the early Jay Connor days. Um and you can walk through a bit of what got you to the current Jay Connor days, and um, we'll just roll from there. So tell tell us in the audience uh, um, again a, a bit about your personal backstory as well as uh, some of your early profession. And sure. We'll so um, so my wife Carol Joy and I live here in Eastern North Carolina in a really really small town, Moorhead City, North Carolina. Uh, she's actually from Wichita Falls, Texas. Hey, go Texas. Were, were right. you um were you born and raised there or did you move yeah. there at some point? No, nope. this is my hometown. Um I went to high school right down the road, uh, not far from my office here. And um so yeah, this is my hometown. Brilliant. I love that. Okay. And and how did you and your wife bump into each other being so far apart uh originally? Well, um so I was raised in the manufactured housing business, mobile homes. And uh, my dad's company, it was a retail company selling the product. And so my dad's company was expanding out to Texas. 
uh, headquarters here in North Carolina. And um, so at one time, he was the largest retailer, seller of mobile homes, manufactured housing in the nation, his company. He was a public company. And so as his company was expanding, uh, this goes back to when I was in my mid-20s. And so I moved out to Texas, specifically Wichita Falls, Texas, to uh, be at the expansion of the company. We're opening up retail sales centers out there. So my first Sunday in town at church, I met Carol Joy at church there, and the preacher there got us introduced. And so we've been dating for 39 years, and we've been married 37 of those 39 years. <laughs> <laughs> That's love that. And so eventually yeah. you found your so way back out, to North Carolina. Yeah, I lived out there for a couple of years. We got married and then I moved back here to North Carolina in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I actually went to Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem and then moved back out here in, in my late, uh, well, I was 26 years old and uh, moved out here um, and then lived there for a couple of years, then moved back here to the hometown and we were in the mobile home manufactured housing business until 2003. And the reason we got out of it was the financing for the product um, fell out of favor at Wall Street. So the consumer financing for the product really went away. So there was no way to sell them because we didn't have the financing. I knew if I ever got out of mobile homes or manufactured housing, I wanted to get into single family houses. And the reason for that it's all the way back to 10 years prior to that in 1993, good friends of ours, Craig and Kim, uh, live in Newburn, North Carolina, about 30 minutes away, and they were wanting to build their new house back in 1993, and they didn't have the, the seed money or the down payment money to do that. Well, Kim's daddy was a real estate investor down in Florida. He says, well, i tell you what, I'll come up there to Newburn. And we'll buy a fixer upper. I'll pay for it. You all can do the sweat equity, fix it up, and we'll sell it. And you can keep the profit for building your new house. So in 90 days from start to finish, they pocketed $30,000 back in 1993 on this little single family house. And I'm busting my butt trying to make $3,000 on a single wide mobile home. Commission. I'm going, man. I like 30,000 better than 3,000. <laughs> yeah. And um, so anyway, 10 years later, uh, you know, the industry for manufactured housing pretty much goes away. So that's when we started. Our very first year, I only did three houses. And I didn't want to do more than one at a time. I wanted to go from start to finish and start to finish. And, you know, I don't recommend to anybody starting out in real estate investing the way I did. I just relied on my experience from the manufactured housing business. I didn't go to any seminars. I didn't go to any conferences. That was a huge mistake because I tell you, there's no telling how many hundreds of thousands of dollars that I have lost because I didn't have the education that I needed for this industry. And plus back during that time, uh, I was using unsecured lines of credit at the bank to fund my deals. And I didn't know anything about private money back then. I didn't know anything about self-directed IRAs. I didn't know anything about um, uh, buying creatively, such as buying houses subject to the existing note and seller financing and all that stuff. And um, so, yeah, I, I spent a lot. I, I went to a lot of seminars that <laughs> I did not plan on attending, if you know what yeah. I mean. Yeah, I tell yeah. people all the time, you're going to pay for your education one way or the other. It's a lot cheaper to pay for your education without making the mistakes. Pay for the education and, you know, get hooked up with somebody that can help you that's already, you know, been through the minefield, if you will. Yeah, we're big fans of of that philosophy. We we started our own business in 2017 and we went about it in that way in the real estate space. We found a coach and a mentor and a program and just with exactly that mindset of of not wanting to repeat the mistakes that somebody else had made and then fast forward a few years later we got into commercial real estate and we did a similar thing. We found a, a group and a coach and uh, the mistakes could be a lot bigger when you're buying, um, you know, million or multi-million dollar properties. And so, yeah, definitely uh, wanted to minimize any mistakes mm -hmm. and accelerate the learning process, right? You can leave 
tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars on the table while you're trying to do it yourself and step through the minefield of uh, figuring it all out. Um, but it's a it's a great philosophy and mm. and it's a hard one for some people, but it's really worth it. Absolutely. I mean, it's a lot cheaper cash flow wise to invest in good education, a good coach, a good mentor. It's a lot cheaper to do that than to make very, very costly mistakes because you just don't know what you're doing. So it sounds like you had, um, from the way you, from, if I'm understanding correctly, you had the seed of real estate curiosity and really seeing the power of it. Um, and then when the opportunity came around, uh, or, you know, you had some, um, I guess the, the, mo the mobile home industry wasn't as attractive. You already had the thoughts that, Hey, I, I want to pivot into this at some point. And so opportunity presented itself and you stepped into it and, and were able to, to go about it. Yeah. Nice. And so uh, if I remember correctly, you did that for, it sounds like five or six years and, until 2008, 2009 and another, um, snag or obstacle, uh, a small one there came in front of you. Um, you can walk us through that yes, a little bit. Um, yes, it was, it was actually January of 2009. Uh, for those first six years from 2003 to 2009, January, 2009, I was just using the local bank, branch bank and trust. Steve was my banker. Um, that's all I knew to do. And, um, and I called him up and I learned on the phone that I had lost my line of credit. I've been shut down with no notice. And so then I asked a friend, uh, what in the world was he doing to fund his deals? And I learned he had been shut down as well at his bank in Greensboro. And um, so he told me about um, private money. I'd never heard of private money. I'd never heard, I didn't know what it was. In fact, I'd never even heard of hard money lenders. I mean, for goodness sakes, I'm living down here on the edge of the world in little old Moorhead City, North Carolina, on the beach. And, um, you know, that's what happens when you're not hanging around other people that are like-minded doing what you're doing. I mean, I was literally out here on an island by myself doing this business. And so when I was cut off from the bank, then that's when I got plugged into learning about private money. And I started teaching people in our own network, people we go to church with, people that are in my cell phone my own network as to what private money is and how they can make high rates of return safely and securely. And so, you know, today, I mean, I started out with a couple of private lenders, uh, in 90 of those first 90 days, I raised a little over $2 million in private money. And since that time, I've never missed out on a deal, a real estate deal, because I did not have the funding. And so what I did, my whole approach was, teaching people what this is. And, you know, here's what's interesting. Today, we have 47 private lenders that are funding our deals, individuals, human beings, just like us. They're using their investment capital. Some are using only their retirement funds. Some people are using their investment capital and their retirement funds to invest in our deals. And so my whole approach was to teach them and, you know, what's interesting is every one of these 47 private lenders that we have right now that are funding our real estate deals, none of them, not one of these 47 people had ever heard of private money, private lending. They never heard of self-directed IRA until, as you know what I do, I put on my teacher hat and started teaching people what this is all about. This is my private money teacher. So the mindset is so important to get straight first that we're not running around begging and chasing and selling and asking people for money. What are we doing? We are showing them a way that they can make really, really high rates of return safe and securely. That's, you know, not putting their money in the bank, but investing uh, in our program, all backed by real estate. And it's a win-win scenario. They all absolutely love it. Yeah, it's brilliant. Um, I, I I love what you're saying there because we've done we've done similar things in the commercial space where we bring capital investors into syndication deals, and it is a very education intensive process. It's not a it's not a you know when when you go to talk to the general public, 
99% of people don't understand um, real estate beyond buying and selling a house, right? And so it is a lot about education. And um, because of that, it typically takes a bit longer to to bring somebody down this journey so that they're comfortable enough understanding the process to hand over 50 or 100 or $200,000 to put into a real estate deal. And so, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, well, and you, the, you bring up a really, really, um, a really, really good point right there, Mike. Um, and that is, I mean, I've got some private lenders that I introduced the idea to them and it might be three years down the road before some of them actually are able or they retire and then they have retirement money, you know, come available. Some are immediate. I mean, I've raised $969,000 at just one private lender luncheon where I put on an event at the local uh, Dunes Club, which is a beach club right here in our area. Very, very nice, beautiful location. You're looking at the ocean. I feed them lunch. And then I do a 20-minute, 25-minute presentation on what private money is and how the program works and the kind of returns that we pay. And and then there's an interest form on, on the table for them to write down. Are they interested in, you know, uh, learning more, having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Notice I'm never asking for money directly. Do you want some more education? Would you like to get some more questions answered? I never have to ask anybody for money. In fact, when we follow up with people after we have a private money uh, luncheon, we call them, thank them for coming to the luncheon. And the only thing we ask for is their feedback on how we could have made it better. And did the information make sense? Or could we have made the information better, right? I never ask them, do you, I mean, they're automatically going to tell you without you asking if they, if they are ready to move forward or not. And in fact, here's how we invite people to private lender luncheons. We call them up and we say, look, I'm putting on this event. Um, I'm, I want to buy you lunch and I'm going to be teaching people a new way that most people have never heard of on how to really rate, make high rates of return super safe and super easy and all passive. And I need your help. There's the magic phrase. I need your help. I would really like for you to come, even if you've got nothing to invest, I don't care. I, I want you to come to help support me with this event. There's the magic sauce. And I really, I don't care if they got money to invest or not, because the more people I can have at the private lender luncheon where I'm exposing more people to this avenue, then I don't know who they're going to tell. Even if they're not interested, who are they going to share this with? So the more people that you can get in front of to share your opportunity as to how they can get involved in your business, the better. Mm. Thank you for sharing that, Jay. And I was curious before you you mentioned about the private events that you, you've been doing, what was your strategy to find the people that wanted to hear about this or that you taught about this concept? Sure. So the first step, I mean, assuming you know your program, and by the way, in my book, I actually spell out my exact private lending program that I offer to our private lenders. So assuming you know your program and that, you know, you're comfortable presenting the information, then the first step is make, is what I just say, make your list, make your list of potential private lenders from your own contacts. So who should be on your list? And I say, make a list of 40 people. 40 people seems to be the magic number. Um, and there's multiple ways to get the, the word out, Right. And we'll talk about that. But, you know, I didn't go run around, run around trying to set a, a bunch of appointments with people. I'm going to show you how I actually automated the process. So as far as inviting people to a private luncheon event, I want, to, I want you to put a list together of 40 people. Well, who should, first of all, be on your list? I can tell you. People that are retired. Why would you want retired people on your list? Well, there's a good chance. They've got retirement funds. And if they've got retirement funds, I promise you, they are not happy with what's going on with their retirement funds. I mean, look at the stupid volatility 
of the stock market today. And people that are retired, some of them, I mean, they can't handle the stress of, uh, you know, the stock market fluctuations or, you know, the stock market selling off. Because you see in this program, their principal loan amount, their investment remains the same, just like putting money in a CD. They know exactly what the rate of return is going to be. And they love that. They love knowing. And of course, when we pay what we do, 8% on first position notes and 10% on junior liens, that's still even today a lot more money than they can get in a local certificate of deposit. So retired people, who else should be on that list? Centers of influence in your community. Centers of influence in your community. If you've got a contact to the mayor, to other people, centers of influence, people that are very involved in the Rotary Club that, you know, all connected, any, any people that are well known in your community, invite them to your event. They might not be interested, but that's okay. They are a center of influence and who knows who they're going to tell. The third category of people to invite to your event are entrepreneurs or business owners or high-level managers. Why? Because they get it. They get it. People, I mean, I mean, we've got a lot, we got a, I got a lot of private lenders in those 47 people that are self-employed or they're retired from being self-employed. They own their own businesses. So they get it. They and when you teach the program, they understand the program. Now, one thing I mentioned a moment ago is how do I automate this process? Now, if you're invite, if you're putting on an event, obviously the first thing you do is put it on the calendar because nothing happens without a self-imposed deadline, right? So I want to schedule my private money event. Typically the best days to do it are either Tuesdays, Wednesdays, or Thursdays. So I get it on the calendar. I make my list. In fact, I've got a script um, in my book of what to say when you call them up. And again, that magic phrase is, I need your help. Now, how else do I get the word out very quickly? And, and my, uh, my mastermind members as well, I, I give this to them. So one thing I did when I, when I uh, was cut off from the banks way back 2003, I wrote a script and I recorded it. Now, back then it was on CDs. Today it's on MP3 and a, a QR code to go listen to. But I wrote a script of this audio, 16-minute audio called Stress-Free Investing. Now, here's the way this automated process works of attracting private money. Stress-Free Investing, 16-minute audio, introduces the idea of private money and what it is. As I said, none of my 47 private lenders ever heard of private money or private lending until I introduced them to it. So this audio gives the overview of what private money is and how you can be a totally passive real estate investor, but it does not spill the beans. Well, what do I mean by it doesn't spill the beans? It doesn't go into the details of the program as far as what interest rate uh, are you paying? What's the length of the note? What's the frequency of payments? Um, how can you get your money back early in case of an emergency? But those questions are raised, right? So the point and the purpose of this 16-minute audio is to get your contacts greed glands in their neck swelling up <laughs> where they can't wait to hear the details of your private lending program. I'll tell you a short story. So when I was first raising private money, I, I recorded this 16-minute audio, and it was on a Monday night. Here at the local uh, pharmacy, at the Medical Park Pharmacy, they were putting on a, a, a little clinic at 7:30 on a Monday night, and they were uh, they were going to be they were going to have this product to help you lose weight. Well, I wanted to lose a little bit of weight, so I went there. I always kept my 16 minute audio, my CDs in the car, so I went in there to the pharmacy and I met this guy named Al. Now I found out very very quickly that they were going to be selling these female hormone drops that you put underneath your tongue. And when you take these female hormone drops underneath your tongue every morning for 30 days, you can eat all the Cheetos you want and you'll lose 30 pounds. 
And I'm going, sign me up. I love Cheetos and I want to lose 30 pounds. Well, I met Al there at the pharmacy. I never met Al before in my life. Well, let me tell you something. Al needed more, a lot more female hormone drops than I did, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so anyway, so we meet each other and, um, the, the, you know, the, the little presentation is over. Well, Al gets his female hormone drops. I get mine. And I said, Al, by the way, and I didn't ask him what he did. I didn't know. I said, Al, by the way, I got a 16 minute audio. I want to give you, it'll show you how to make higher returns on your money than you can get anywhere else. I'll be right back. So I went to the car and I brought him the CD and I handed it to him. And I said, look, by the way, this has got nothing to do with multi-level marketing. And I promise you, you're going to love this 16 minutes. There's my cell number on the cover. You call me if, if this resonates with you. Well, off out goes. I didn't even get his last name. I didn't get his phone number or nothing. Well, that was on Monday night. On, on Thursday, he called me up. He said, Jay, I've listened to this audio three times. Well, I could tell his greed glands were already swollen up, right, in his neck. And I said, uh, he says, I've listened to this three times. When can we get together? You see, he hadn't heard the interest rate or that kind of thing. I said, well, I don't know when you want to get together. He says, well, I'm on the road right now. He says, but I'll be back home on Monday. I said, okay, well, come on down to my office on Monday. So he walked here into my office, and we went there in the conference room, and we sat down, and I said, um, well, by the way, Al, I didn't even ask you when I met you last week. What do you do? He said, multi-level marketing. <laughs> <laughs> I said, really? Well, I quickly <laughs> learned that Al had a big problem. Al had over a million dollars in his checkbook, and he didn't know what to do with it. And, of course, it was my ethical and moral responsibility to relieve him of his problem. So, anyway, I went through my little presentation, uh, which, by the way, is all in the book as far as teaching the program. Notice I'm not telling Al about a deal. We never talk about a deal uh, with the program because if you do, you're going to sound desperate. And like you've heard me say, desperation's got a smell to it. So I'm not going to come across desperate. So I showed the program to him. Al sitting right there became our next $650,000 private lender. He didn't want to give me the whole million. He wanted to start with $650,000. He eventually made his way to a million dollars. And you know what? He referred a friend of his uh, actually a couple, a retired couple up in uh, Tennessee. And now they, I mean, they've loaned us over four uh, five hundred $500,000 on our deals just because of the word of mouth. So the moral of that story is be sure and use the 16 minute audio that I talk about in the book, have that ready all the time. The other moral of that story is don't waste your money on female hormone drops because they do not work. Mm. <laughs> I'm gonna make a Point note. Take. I'm gonna make a note of that right now. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> That's great. I love oh, it. Oh yes. man, yeah. The power. It, so many great nuggets there. I, I can't even re-summarize re re all of them. But I am curious about um, a couple things. A lot of things. But um, your business model, it, exactly. So. Um, we give you five hundred thousand dollars to leverage into into some real estate. There, what what happens practically from from cradle to grave? Uh, sure. So yeah. the first thing that happens is you're just going to tell me, as my new private lender, how much you got to work with. If it's so, you got five hundred thousand. If it's retire, if it's in retirement funds, then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to the self-directed IRA company that I always recommend to get your retirement funds moved from wherever they are right now. They might be in the stock market. They might be in a previous employer's 401k, wherever they are. Yeah, which <clears> by the way, I didn't, mention, I didn't mention this earlier when you were going through it, but by the way, on top of the, the volatility of all that, there are so many fees and hidden fees and things that are being sucked out of people's uh, IRAs and index funds and all of that stuff that, you know, I, I know my parents, uh, every time they talk about it, they're, to your point, they're extremely disappointed with uh, the performance of their 
investments, which it's largely because of all of that. Uh, and so, yeah, another reason, get it in your own self-directed account. Uh, some of them you can be your own custodian custodian and uh and do all that kind of stuff so sorry to interrupt exactly. but okay no 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 you're you're exactly right so so we're going so i'm going to help you get it ready to go if it's just sitting in your checkbook or checking account you're ready to go if you need to move it over to the self traded ira company with current retirement funds that normally takes two to three weeks to get that done so now you're ready to go so the next thing that's going to happen is i'm going to find a deal for you to fund or participate in just as soon as possible because if you've just got investment capital and you're waiting for me to put your money to work well you're not gonna wait forever because private money's like bananas in the grocery store if you don't consume it pretty quickly it'll go it'll, it'll disappear on you right ask me how i know that um if it's retirement funds you've got and you've moved them over to a self-directed ira company you are counting on me to put your money to work that's why you moved it over was so that I could put her to work for you. So I am ethically bound to find a deal just as soon as possible. So you're ready to go. So now I'm going to find a deal. Well, here's an important point. If you're so, first of all, <clears throat> I preach and practice the money comes first, get the money lined up for your deals first, because I tell you what, Mike, y'all might've heard it. I don't know. You probably have. I've heard it many, many times. And every time I hear it, I want to throw up. You got these gurus going around saying, just get the deal under contract. The money will <laughs> show up. Where? Where is the money going to show up? Well, now if you're wholesaling and you got a buyer's list, well, you needed to put that buyer's list together first, right? But I say, if you're going to stay in any deals, if you're going to stay in the deals, Get your money lined up first. So, so you've told me how much you got. So it's very, very important if you're going to raise private money, you need to know what your consistent lead machine, lead magnet machine is going to look like to have consistent seller leads coming into your funnel all the time, right? Um, I mean, I tell people all the time, if you don't have consistent seller leads, sellers of properties. Now I'm talking about in the, I'm talking about in the single family space, right? If you don't have leads coming in consistently, you got a hobby. You don't have a business. So I have multiple channels where I have sellers for sale by owners, individual. I mean, I'm not getting any deals out of the multiple listing service. I hadn't bought a deal out of the multiple listing service since COVID, right? I mean, it's been quite a while. So we market every day to individuals that own properties that don't even have their house for sale yet in the multiple listing service. Either the property is distressed or they are distressed or both. So who do we market to? Well, I've got three different vendors that I use for pay-per lead, not pay-per-click. Pay-per-click on Google is if you're doing it yourself. So I pay pay per lead, but the Google, those are people that are going on Google and they're searching for sell my house fast or buy my house fast or those kinds of key terms. So we get leads coming in from them. I got, I do Facebook ads. I do, I've got two different Facebook ad campaigns going all the time. Thirdly, I got a direct mail campaign going to everybody in foreclosure. We've got eight letters that we mail to them sequentially. We also, um, I got a full-time outbound caller that works 40 hours a week, and we're calling tired landlords. Uh, we're calling inherited properties. In fact, those are the two categories that we're buying most of our properties on right now, and that's inherited properties, tired landlords, and uh, also tax delinquents uh, is pretty popular as well. So we got all these leads coming in. So now I have a lead come in. I negotiate the deal with my acquisitionist does that actually talks to all the sellers for me. I decide what I want to offer in the house. We get the, we get the house under contract. Now, once the house is under contract, now let's say uh, you two are my new private lender. You got 500,000. And so I call you up with the good news phone call and the good news phone call. What does it say? 
So I call y'all up and I say, I got great news. I can now put your money to work, but I can't put all of it to work. You've got 500,000. I know you told me that, but I can put half of it to work right now. I can put 250 to work. I'm negotiating on some other deals uh, right now, and hopefully I can put all of it to work. But then I'll tell you about the property. So I'll say, I've got, I've got a property uh, in Newport with an, an after repaired value of $400,000. Uh, I can use your $250,000 on that property. Uh, closing is going to be next Friday. You'll need to have two hundred and fifty dollars of your five hundred dollars wired to my real estate attorney's trust account. You're not going to send me the money directly. I never get money directly from my private lenders. It's going to go to the closing agent either your real estate attorney or your title company trust account. And I'm going to have them email you the wiring instructions for you to send it out next week. Um, so I'm not pitching you the deal. Why am I not pitching you the deal? Because I'm not bringing you a deal to fund unless it matches the criteria of the program that I already taught you. You already know I'm not going to borrow more than 75% of the after repaired value on the house. Um, so, you already know what the parameters are that a property has got to meet for me to even tell you the good news that you can now fund it. So that's the end of that conversation. You are the funds. Um, we close on the deal. And then what happens right after that? Well, you as the private lender, you got your own promissory note. You got your own in North Carolina. It's a deed of trust. Most people call it a mortgage. And so after that deal is recorded on public record, the uh, closing agent, the real estate attorney is going to mail you the original promissory note, and they're going to also mail you the recorded mortgage or deed of trust that collateralizes your note. In addition to that, I'm going to name you as the mortgagee on the insurance policy. So I'm giving you all the protection, just like a bank. So if you borrow money from the bank and get a mortgage, the bank's named as the mortgagee. You, as the private lender, you're named as the mortgagee on the insurance policy. Well, that gives you another layer of protection because if I ever file a claim, an insurance claim, on that property, well, the insurance company is going to make the check payable to not only my entity, but to you as well as the mortgagee. So you're going to have to sign off on that check, another layer of protection. I'm also going to name you on the title policy as an additional insured, in case there's any title issues down the road, you're protected as well. All of us are protected. So now we're going to start most of these properties we buy, not most, all, need renovation to some degree. And so you will have wired me money for the purchase, and you will have wired me money in that $250,000 for the renovations as well. Now, if you didn't, wire the money for the renovations. I may have another private lender in second position, junior position underneath you um, that may have loaned me $50,000 or whatever for the rehab. They've got their own separate note, their own deed of trust or mortgage. And so then we'll renovate the property. And in this market, since we have no inventory, we'll put it in the multiple listing service with our realtor. We'll sell it. And then you will get cashed out. You'll get your principal loan amount that you invested. All of that comes back to you from the closing agent that represented the buyers of that house. So you'll get paid off along with any unpaid accrued interest that we haven't paid you interest for, you know, in the interim. And then we will rinse and repeat. It's great. Um, I, I mean, it's uh, it's clean. We 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 run a land business where we do a lot of owner financing, and so a lot of the terminology is very similar. We used, you know, uh, promissory notes and and contracts and and uh, transfer of title through the deed. Um, just so I'm clear that I'm clear on your process. Um, in this in this instance, like, what would the what would a hypothetical purchase price be that you had bought that property for. So are you saying like um, you had 250,000 to allocate, maybe another 50. So are, are you buying the property for 250 and then you're estimating another 50 in the renovations and then you sell it for four? Um, is, that, is that what it is? Or you, you mentioned, you mentioned um, 
75, not, not leveraging more than 75%. So is that coming from somewhere um, that I'm, I'm not picking yeah, up on? So, right. So 75, so I'm not allowing my private lenders to loan me more than 75% of the after repaired value. So let's oh, run gotcha. the numbers. Okay. Loan to value the type after thing. Yeah. Value. So, so let's say the after repaired value uh, on a property is $400,000. Okay. So that's the after repaired value. So I can borrow up to 75%, which is 300,000 on that after repaired value. So I can borrow up to 300. Now, um, let's say you loaned me to, well, you had 500. In this case, you could loan me the whole amount. You could loan me 300,000. Or if I used half of your 500, you can loan me 250,000. And I could get 50000 from another private lender in second position. So now we're talking about total loan to value. Total loan to value, meaning I'm adding your loan amount of 250 to another private lender's loan amount of 50. 250 plus 50 equals 300000 divided by 400 is 75%. Now, let me share with you, you asked the question, well, what would you be buying this property for? with an after repaired value of 400,000. So here's my formula. So I take 400,000 as the after repaired value. Any after repaired value over $300,000, I'm going to multiply times 80%, 80%. And so then that's 320. Now I'm going to subtract repairs, all right? So let's say repairs are $50,000. So I'm subtracting 50,000 repairs from that 320. And so that equals, of course, $270,000. That's what we call the maximum allowable offer. But I never offer the maximum allowable offer because Murphy, what can go wrong will go wrong. Murphy and his family always show up on renovations, even when you've got a home inspection. So I would probably give myself another $20,000 cushion, okay? on this purchase, right? So another 20,000 cushion, I would buy this property for no more than $250,000. So I buy it for 250, renovations are 50,000 in our example, there's a total, there's 300,000 that I need for the purchase and the renovation. So I'm borrowing 300,000. I'm getting a check of $50,000 when I buy. I mean, who wants to get paid to buy houses, right? I love the phrase on my real estate attorney's check stub. It's called excess cash to close. And I love me some excess cash, right? So I'm taking no money to the closing table. I'm I mean, every private lender deal that I do is really a no down payment uh, proposition. I'm not taking any down payment. And people ask me, they say, Jay, why would a private lender loan you money on a deal and you got no skin in the game? Well, I can tell you what the skin in the game is. The skin in the game is the equity in that property. So if I don't pay them and they get the property, they got a house that's worth $400,000 after fix up. Now they don't want to mess with it. They don't want to mess with the fix up. They don't want to mess, you know, with the rehab. So even if they sold it for, you know, $350,000 or $325,000, they're still made whole, right? So that's the way it works. Those are the formulas that I use on maximum amount that I'm borrowing and the maximum amount that I'm going to pay. So it's very typical for me to buy a house at 50 cents or less than 50 cent, 50% of the after repaired value. Mm-hmm. And is there or has there been a situation um, in which the values have drastically changed such that um, equity's not there for somebody that's lended money? Or I guess that risk is theoretically there? Right. Well, since we're getting in and out a lot of these deals within six months to nine months, the market's not going to shift that much in a six month or nine month period. But again, that's why we only borrow up to 75% of the after repaired value. We want to give our private lenders that 25% equity cushion to where if prices are coming down quickly, we can cash out and liquidate fast enough 
to where the private lenders made whole. And that brings up a good point. I've, ever since 2003, every private lender has gotten every cent that was promised to them on, I mean, I've rehabbed over 500 houses right here in this local area. And every private lender has gotten a hundred percent of what was coming to them. Why is that? It's because of the way that we buy conservatively. Yeah, it's a great model. I mean, we, we do the same thing, but with land, I mean, we, we don't buy unless it's at a certain percentage to the, the market value. Um, so the profits, you know, baked in and guaranteed, um, in, in a sense there. Um, yeah, I, I love it. And yeah, you, I don't think you touched on this earlier in this podcast, but you are, you are operating in a very small geographical region, just right there close to home, right? You're not, it's not like you're across the country looking for deals everywhere. You're able to successfully do 500 plus homes in, in your small market there in North Carolina. That's right. Yeah. Our total market, I mean, surrounding Moorhead city, our total market is only 40 to 50,000 people, right? And so since it is a small market, I want to dominate the market with our marketing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. You can flood, flood the zone. I mean, I would, I would much rather be a big fish in a small bowl than a <laughs> small fish in a big bowl. <laughs> I hear you. Yeah, same. That's great. Um, so... I mean, you have gone from, I guess you said you, 2003, you, you started with this business model and um, since done 500, 500 deals and been able to scale. What, what's, what's been your approach to scaling your operation? Has it just organically grown year after year? You've, you've continued to invest in marketing and uh, outreach and word of mouth, or was there some kind of a strategy there to... Well, that's a good big. question. So, so how, how have we been able to grow it? Well, when I started out, I was the most disorganized mess you have ever seen. I was trying to run this business on a bunch of post-it notes. Now, don't get me wrong. I still use my, I still use my post-it notes, right? But I was trying to run the whole business on post-it notes. And it wasn't until I got our proprietary software that we got developed to keep up with all my leads. I mean, there's no telling how many millions of dollars I've lost because I didn't have a um, follow-up system in place that was automated with software. And so the business really changed when I started getting all my seller leads in the software, all of our buyer leads. I've sold a lot of homes on rent to own and to where I mean, I got the same acquisitionist that talks to our sellers. She's been with me for 18 years, right? And so instead of us spending hours on the phone talking through deals and trying to, because she works from home, trying to figure out what I'm going to offer, it's all in the software now. I mean, I might talk to her over the phone once every three months or whatever. All the communication is in the software. So how are we able to, how are we able to scale the business? your team members. Um, my dad is known for being the 3D man, which stands for dictate, delegate, and disappear. He's great at getting out of his own way, right? And I was running around with my hair on fire trying to do everything myself. You cannot scale your business if you're out there trying to do it all yourself. So my team member, I mean, I haven't gone and looked at a house in years as far as before buying it. So how's that automated? Well, once my act, so I've got, my job is keep the marketing machine turned on. I got to have at least 15 to 20 leads coming in a week and getting property lead sheets. My acquisition is getting that. And so I got the marketing machine turned on. Uh, once we determine myself and the acquisitions determined that it looks like that could be a deal. So then I asked my realtor to give me the after repaired value, even though I know this market very well. So the realtor will give us a, a, an after repaired value, but all this is done in the software. It's just like moving a deal through the pipeline in the software. So all I do is I click on the lead and, and take my mouse and move that little box over to the next pipeline that says, get realtor opinion. Well, it automatically sends an email to our realtor from the software that says, need your opinion on this property. 
So then the realtor sends that back to my acquisitionist. She puts it back in the software. Now I'm notified there's a realtor opinion for me to review. I review the realtor opinion. And then if the numbers make sense, I then move it over on the, uh, on the pipeline and I say schedule appointment. So now my acquisitionist has automatically got a message to schedule an appointment for our uh, crew leader, our project manager, and the realtor to go look at the house. So that gets scheduled and they go look at the house and my project manager gives me a budget sheet on the renovation. The acquisitionist puts that in the software. Now I get a notification, hey, there's a budget sheet that you need to review in the software. So I look at the budget sheet, I run the numbers, I make the offer. Now I move it over in the pipeline in the software, it says make offer. And so then, by the way, I never bought a house that I didn't make an offer on, right? So make offers, make offers, make offers. So <laughs> I'm moving over to pipeline and here's the offer that I want to make. If they're asking a ridiculous price and there's no spread, then I just move it over to pass. And then my acquisitionist communicates with the uh, sellers. So it's because of these systems that we now have in place. And my mastermind members absolutely love duplicating these systems. It's because of these systems that I'm actually able to run this business, uh, this seven figure net business per year in less than 10 hours a week. I mean, I got two jobs, make sure the marketing machine is turned on. We got seller leads coming in the pipeline and I'm in the software and I am pushing the buttons on what we should do next with this deal. So my total involvement in the software is maybe 20 or 30 minutes a day. That's it. Great. Yeah, it's a it's a beautiful, uh, very efficient sounding system. Are you also involved on the uh, private money side of things? Are you still hosting luncheons, giving online seminars, or how, how is that working for you? No, I haven't hosted a private lender luncheon in quite a while. Um, and is that here's just because what you have a bank of, of lenders already? Well, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, what happens after a while is you, is you get some new private lenders and then they, you know, they spread the word and you got referrals. And so really I have a juggling act right now. And that is doing my best to make sure that I keep our private lenders available funds invested. So I'm not having to actively go out and raise any more new private money. It's just a matter of keeping all this money we have available at work and invested. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like some high percentage of your, uh, I'm going to call them clients, reinvest beyond, all right? They went all of them. <laughs> <laughs> all of them. Yeah, I was about I was about to say that you should you have all these private lenders that uh, you know with the model rinse and repeat uh, after they get their money and the profit after a deal they want to reinvest all the time. So all that the keeps time. you moving. I mean, where else are they going to go? Right? Yeah. Where else are they going to go? Crypto. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I heard Bitcoin recently went crazy. <laughs> well, it does. It does. Uh, and then it goes crazy down and then crazy high. It's a, right. it's a crazy business model. Yeah, that's brilliant. I, I love it. Yeah. Um, just shifting gears just a little bit uh, more to uh, maybe your mindset and your personality. Um, it sounds like, and I see a lot of parallels, honestly, I, I grew up, uh, my dad was a general contractor in the eighties when, um, really home building was taking off. Well, actually before that, uh, my parents were the original house flippers. Like they, I, I lived in, um, uh, 30 homes in my childhood because my parents would, would buy a home that needed fixing up. We would live in it and then they would be renovating it while we lived in it and then sell it for a profit and buy another home. And, um, I, I'm amazed to hear, I mean, I remember the homes we lived in and some of them were very nice, large homes in beautiful neighborhoods that they bought for th less than $10,000. Like, you know, that I, I, this is in Fort Worth, Texas, and I'll, I'll drive around every once in a while when I'm back visiting. And, you know, some of them are worth 
seven figures now. And it's just crazy to think of the values and the way they've, they've appreciated. But anyway, we, we did the home flipping thing, living in, and then my dad became a general contractor and, and the, and the business really took off. But then you had the savings and loans crisis that, that really uh, hit all of the real estate industry. Mm -hmm. And then it became overly burdensome for him to go about, you know, before he could do deals on a handshake, he would go into the bank and, lending was very easy and there weren't a whole lot of regulations. And then it just became really crazy to, to be able to get money. And a lot of the big box home builders came in and they were just building cheap product and, and doing all this stuff. So it was hard to compete, but it was, uh, it was definitely a journey. Um, and I, for whatever reason, I did not get that bug as a child to, I didn't go the entrepreneurial route. I went a corporate route and got into a company and got a job and a 401k and all that stuff until later in life. And then I, I decided I wanted to go the entrepreneurial route. But it sounds like it sounds like your dad had a company, um, uh, uh, quite a large company, and you worked in the company uh, at a certain age. And, um, and so I don't know if that if you already had this personality as a child, or if this was something cultivated over time from working and watching he and his company and, and doing all that. But it sounds like you, you've taken some of that and, and put it into your own journey uh, once you got into real estate and just have continued to develop your company to a really large size. Is that, is that something that, that you think just came naturally to you or you, you uh, worked at over the years or? Well, um, being ha having the opportunity so my personality has always been the same right it's like uh -huh. i'm like the pretty ha i'm like the most happiest person you're probably ever going to meet in your life i just that's just the way i'm wired right um and i learned <clears throat> years ago a formula from jack canfield which is called uh e plus r equals o whatever event the e stands for event whatever event happens in your life you may not have been responsible for that Maybe you were, maybe you aren't, but the event happens. <clears throat> and let's say it's a challenge. Well, you're 100% responsible for the R, which stands for your response to that event. You get to choose your response, which therefore equals O, which, e, which stands for the outcome. So we are so blessed to be able to choose how we want to respond to anything that comes our way and therefore be a part and decide what you want your destiny to be. So it's all about having a mindset of being a victor and not being a victim, if you know what I mean. Most people go through life with the tide taking them wherever the tide to go, right? And so anyway, I'm sure being around my dad and his brilliant mind um, for many years working in the uh, company with him, um, had a huge influence on me and how I go about my business, how I treat my people, how I treat my team members. Um, I never look down at anybody. I'm not better than anybody else. We all have got a very, very important role to play on the team or you wouldn't be here. Right. And so, um, the way that I'm able to interact with people, um, I'm sure plays into the uh, success as well. But, you know, it's like Zig Ziglar says, you just help enough other people get what they want. You'll have all you want. I believe big time in the law of reciprocity and what mm -hmm. goes around comes around. Yeah, I think that is just a beautiful way to mm -hmm. put a pin in this podcast and, and, uh, and put a bow on it. Those are some beautiful words of wisdom. Mm -hmm. uh, I find a kindred spirit in, in you, Jay. Um, yes really uh, impressed with what you've built there and, and intrigued. And for anyone out there listening whose uh, greed glands are bulging or that wants to get in touch and hear a little bit more about you, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Absolutely. So I'd love to give my book away. Uh, this book is called Where to Get the Money Now, subtitle, How and Where to Get Money for Your Real Estate Deals Without Relying on Hard Money Lenders or Institutional Lenders. And uh, you can get the book for free. This is not an ebook. You can't download it. I'll actually autograph it, uh, ship it to you, three day priority mail. And uh, you can get the book for free at www.jayconner, J A Y C O N N E R.com forward slash book. So I'm an E R, not an O R. So that's Jay Conner, J A Y C O N N E R.com forward slash book. 
Uh, the book's free, just cover shipping and handling, and we'll ship it right out to you. Awesome. Beautiful. Well, thanks again for coming on the show, sharing your wisdom, adding value to your community, and um, helping educate uh, so many people about uh, good, consistent, steady ways to make money and earn cash flow. And uh, we, we do appreciate your time and yes. uh, getting to meet you, Jake. You are certainly welcome. Thank you so much for having me on, and God bless y'all. Same to you. God Take bless care. you as well. Bye-bye. For those of you joining us today, we hope you enjoyed this time in the Champion's Corner as much as we did. Got some awesome takeaways, and most importantly, we'll take action to continue living your best life and maximizing your potential. Mindset is such an important aspect of life, and when coupled with action, delivers undeniably powerful results. Please subscribe to the podcast to hear from more great guests and get the latest mindset mastery insights and cash flow matchups. Again, thank you so much for investing your time with us, and we look forward to seeing you next time on the Cash Flow Fight Club podcast. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconnor.com slash money guide. That's J-C-O-N-N-E-R dot com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconnor.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.